Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome and thanks very much for uh, joining us at today's webinar. Just a few quick introductory comments before we start. So I'm Neil Ward. I'm based at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, and I'm one of the co-conveners of the AFN Network Plus. Uh, the network is focused on the UK agri-food system and identifying and tackling the barriers to transitioning to a net zero UK by 2050. Uh, it's funded for three years by UKRI, which is the umbrella body for the, um, the UK research councils and was launched last autumn. Uh, we're hosting a range of activities over the three years to promote interactions and knowledge exchange. And we're commissioning some research projects during 2023 and 2024. Um, you can sign up to become a member of the network via our website and we'll put a link in the chat uh, so if you're if you're not signed up to the network and you want to do that, you'll be able to do it through the link in the chat. Uh, today is the fifth uh, webinar in our uh, series, which we started this spring. And we're very pleased to have Stephen Briggs with us today. Uh, Stephen's from Whitehall Farm in Cambridgeshire. He's been farming organically for more than 20 years. And since 2009, he's been developing uh, agroforestry on the farm, integrating apple trees with cereal production. Uh, at the moment, he's running the largest commercial agroforestry setup in the UK. Uh, in thinking about land farming and the net zero transition, there's been lots of attention focused on afforestation of blocks of um, formerly agricultural land, but perhaps less attention on combining trees with agricultural production. So we're delighted to have Stephen uh, with us contributing to our webinar series today. Um, Stephen's going to speak for about 25 minutes or so, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, please feel free to put uh, any questions in the chat as we go along, and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can, but we will be finishing at four o'clock sharp this afternoon. Uh, we'll be recording the session and aiming to put it on our YouTube channel for others to see. Um, so our four previous webinars you can you can see those on the youtube channel um so if you don't want to be identified as participating then uh, probably best not not to put a question in the chat um so without further ado i think i'll hand over to stephen stephen thanks very much for joining us and um over to you for your talk thanks very much neil um i will aim to share my screen see if we can get the technology to work so hopefully can you all see that? If someone give me a thumbs up. A thumb up? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, afternoon all. Uh, as Neil introduced me, I'm Stephen Briggs, farm over in Cambridgeshire, just on the edge of Peterborough. I wear a number of different hats. Uh, we're first generation farmers here um, on, a, on the holding. We farm in Cambridgeshire and North Shore in Rutland. Uh, I've been heading up a farm business consultancy, Abacus, since 2001. Uh, I'm a non-exec director of the Agriculture Horticultural Development Board and technical lead for Innovation for Agriculture and the Royal Agricultural Society. Um, my background is I started life as a soil scientist when it was deeply unfashionable some 30 years ago. Spent quite a bit of time working overseas and became quite aware of tropical agroforestry. And when we started farming here in Cambridgeshire, we had some some challenges, which I'll allude to uh, during the next 25 minutes. Um, and agroforestry seemed to be the fit. Um, I was very fortunate to be awarded an Uffield Farming Scholarship, which allowed me to travel globally and look at look at agroforestry, uh, which was a, a great opportunity. And I'm just trying to see why this is progressing. Um, for some reason, my screen is not moving forward. I'm just going to stop sharing and just try doing that again. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's, um, let's just try that. Can you see that okay? There we go. Yeah, we, we, yep. Yep. That's right. Out. Yep. Okay, great. Thank okay. You. So, what I'm going to cover off is uh, what are the drivers that uh, took us into agroforestry? What is agroforestry? What are some of the benefits? Uh, ecologically, economically, uh, systems-wise, and 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 then really, uh, in the latter part of the, the talk, just take take you through how we actually did it and what we did on on our own farm over here in Cambridgeshire. So, 
there's no doubt that there's some real challenges ahead for, for broad acre agriculture. Um, you know, is, is a higher input monocultural system still relevant to today's uh, sort of climate change challenges? There's no doubt um, that inputs have become more expensive and less available. Um, we've, we've seen those sort of challenges over the, over the last 18 months in, in particular, um, and that we're being asked to increase productivity, use resources better, and protect and enhance biodiversity. So how, how do we do that? Um, oh, damn it. For some reason, my computer is not allowing me to go forwards and backwards. So I'm just going to stop that again and try sharing again. Uh, to apologize, technology. Okay, so we've got to adapt our farming systems to the challenges of climate change, whether that be uh, increasing drought or increasing deluge. Um, and, and one of the things to think about there is that we know that trees are important for climate change adaptation um, and they, you know, good for cycling uh, carbon dioxide and also um, uh, building carbon into, into our ecosystems. Uh, and so the question I had many years ago was that could trees have an important part within an agricultural system and could agroforestry be an alternative approach? So agroforestry is where we're combining woody perennials, trees, with either crops or livestock on the same unit of land, and where there are significant ecological or economic interactions. They can be positive or negative, but we're trying to design systems to get the, the best of the woody component and the best of the, of the other land use. And typically that's either silvopastoral, uh, trees in grazed, uh, grazed, grazed land, or silver arable, a sort of tree crop combination. And, and nature worked this out an awful long time ago. You know, nature doesn't do monoculture. It, uh, it stratifies in time and space uh, different components to make the best use of different resources. Um, I think one of the things that got me thinking about it to start with was that, you know, on, on, as a grain producer, um, in the period of the year when there's near maximum solar radiation, we effectively turn the solar panels off. And if we consider our biggest single input to any kind of uh, crop or grass production is, is sunlight, solar radiation, um, you wouldn't turn the solar panels off you've got on your house or on your building. Uh, from mid-July through to middle of October, but that's effectively what we do in agriculture. We're turning off that, that input supply. So it started me thinking about how we might be able to, to bridge that gap uh, and capture some of that valuable input. So whether we are we are a solar engineer or whether we're a forester or we're a farmer, we're effectively in the same business, harvesting sunlight, mixing it with carbon dioxide and water, turning it into something uh, which we can eat or sell. Um, and this got me thinking really around the idea of agroforestry, um, recognizing that crops typically take their sunlight, nutrients and water from planting in the autumn or the spring. And then by um, mid-July, they're starting to senesce, go golden in color and stop photosynthesizing. Whereas the trees tend to really only put their leaves on in, in April or maybe early May. And then they carry right on through to October and November, as the Americans call it, fall when they lose their leaves. So there's a real temporal overlap in terms of the, that resource capture and utilization. Added to which, there's also a three dimensional effect. Um, so this is a, a, a graphical representation of uh, some 20 plus year old poplar trees. Um, and in an agroforestry context, the rooting systems are quite different compared to a uh, on, on the left compared to a forest plantation on the right, literally just a few meters apart, completely different root structures. Because as the tree um, uh, in a forest plantation situation puts all its roots near the surface, because that's where the nutrients and water are, in a cr combined cropping agroforestry system, the, the earlier awakening crop mixed with a bit of um, uh, mechanized um, cultivation or root pruning means that the root systems are quite different in terms of space. So there's a level of compartmentalizing to manage that, that competition. Um, we've been involved uh, in a lot of uh, biodiversity monitoring, looking at agroforestry. So the pictures on the right there uh, are um, 
uh, Dr. Alexa Vara doing uh, some PhD research between 2009 and 11. That's actually been repeated on our own farm. That three, you know, we're now in our th third cycle of looking at the same uh, biodiversity and pollinator suites um, and pairing that with a number of different farms and, and seeing real increases in, in sort of net biodiversity and also pollinator abundance and, and diversity across the farm as a result of putting the agroforestry in. And that chimes quite well with some of the work done at AFBI in Northern Ireland with, by Jim McAdam, um, where he, they looked at um, grassland systems, wood, woodland systems under ash and also agroforestry, and again, finding more spiders, birds and beetles. And, um, and the more recent work done at Reading University uh, by, um, as part of the PhD work, looking at sort of the fact that agroforestry tends to bring more birds, plants, fungi and insects and high levels of diversity and they tend to be more of the the beneficial insects and and less of the harmful uh, insects um so so more species abundance more species by biodiversity etc a lot of this this information has been written up in peer-reviewed journals um uh featuring some of the work done on the farm here and and we know just from our own side that we've got 200 percent more solitary bees and other flies an increase of 240 percent more bumblebees 10 times higher species richness etc etc and you know a good indicator for me is farming birds uh, we've got five breeding pairs of barn owls we fledged 13 barn owl chicks last year uh, and that that indicates to me that there's a, there's a lot going on so what we're trying to achieve with agroforestry is improved uh, microclimate um, reducing uh, extremes of cold or extremes of heat, reducing wind speed, which in turn reduces evapotranspiration of water loss from crops by reducing that wind speed at ground level and effectively creating a microclimate, uh, which is more conducive to the kind, of, the kind of crop production we're producing. And we, we do forget that we live in a very windy part of, of the planet, clinging onto the edge of the ocean, and we, we tend to get much windier climates than, than in uh, sort of mainland Europe. So modifying the microclimate is actually really beneficial. If we're thinking about sort of resource use, uh, uh, resource utilization and competition for resources, uh, what's the best way to think about that? Well, well, one of those might be, you know, a primary driver for agricultural production being nitrates, uh, nitrogen fertilizers, and, and you know, sadly, not uh, farming systems are still pretty leaky. Uh, I think nitrogen use efficiency in the UK is still at 48%. So half of what's applied is never used by the intended target. Uh, if we take some data, in this case, actually looked at under some research by INRA in France, looking at um, comparing forestry, agriculture and agroforestry, you've got nitrate losses here of sort of um, uh, uh, um, 20 percent, uh, uh, 20 kilos per year. Um, per hectare under forestry, obviously not much loss because not much used. Under agriculture, that's sort of 35 kilograms of N per hectare per year, which can roughly be halved by implementing agroforestry systems because what the crop misses and that would end up in the drains or in the ditches and in water bodies, which then the water companies have to clear out with nitrate stripping, the woody perennials can take a second bite of the cherry and actually turn that into a different carbon form but stop it stop it actually leaving the farm. Uh, in terms of how we're comparing productivity or think about comparing productivity, so if you look at the agroforestry in the foreground and the, and the, and the sort of monoculture crop in the, in the background, using the principle of a, a sort of land equivalent ratio, so that a one-to-one -one equivalent means it's the same. Um, if we look at a, a hectare of agroforestry mixing trees and, and crops, and compare that to where they would need, where they were grown separately. You'd need a bigger area of agriculture and trees to get the uh, grown separately to get the same level of productivity. And estimates are that um, that can that can result in land equivalent ratios of up to 1.4, which means 100 hectares of agroforestry can produce as much as 140 hectares of farmland where they're grown separately. That's giving us a 40% bounce or a 40% increase in productivity. Um, that's probably at its best. Uh, and looking at some of the pan-European work 
done uh, under various EU projects, this one in particular led by Cranfield, uh, looking at 42 tree crop combinations. They found these land equivalent ratios ranging from sort of 1.1 to 1.4, but the majority being around 1.2, 1.3, but that's still 20 to 30% more productive than a monocultural system. And you think, well, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because you've effectively, you're growing in a bigger area. You're growing in a three-dimensional sense. You're getting taller. Rather than, rather than getting more land, you're getting a three-dimensional increase in farmed area. And secondly, you're using that those resources of water and sunlight for, for a longer period of time by stacking the different elements together is exactly mimicking what nature does. So the research is showing us that we've got some, some good elements in terms of biodiversity, perhaps in terms of landscape, uh, improved soil water and air quality from some of the research that's been done. We'll come to economics in a bit, um, but um, there's certainly a role in terms of climate adaptation and, and building resilience, which I'll, I'll cover from our own experiences. Give you some examples. You know, agroforestry is not all about sort of linear systems and, and crop production. It can be integrating livestock into uh, uh, planted or existing tree systems. Um, it doesn't even have to be planting new trees. There's plenty of opportunity to take poor quality woodland, thin it appropriately, let herbage grow in the base, and actually have um, introduced animals into sort of woodland grazing systems. Um, it's our segregation of forestry and agriculture that has rather separated these elements, but there's clear opportunities for things to work together. Increasingly, we're going to need to provide adequate shade and shelter for animals, uh, both in terms of the winter, but also in terms of some of the hotter summers we're having. Um, and we'll continue to have, so providing those for animal welfare is going to be increasingly important, but we need to do that in a way that that is productive and profitable. Um, there are other, other systems like sort of uh, pro provision of shelter and shade and range for poultry. It's only us as humans that have taken a jungle fowl that is the chicken and put it in a completely alien environment and wonder why it gets very stressed. So providing those ranges uh, can significantly reduce stress on those animals and increase productivity. Uh, and there's good evidence around with various poultry producers showing showing that um, showing that sort of uh, practical element on on the cropping side th that can be a mixture of trees um, uh, fruit nuts biomass production uh, short rotation coppice uh, as, as well as timber and, uh, uh, and other, other other elements as well combined on the same sort of landscape area to provide some of the, the biodiversity economic and landscape benefits that I've described. So why the resistance to some of the adoption of agroforestry? Well, it comes from, I suppose, multiple sources. Um, some of it is that is policy related. Uh, the, the need to ensure that agroforestry is, is part of a, a policy framework. Some of it is actually the status quo. Um, there are plenty of farms that are surrounded by people that actually don't want to see too much change because they have business models predicated around the sort of current production systems. And, and within those, there's obviously some vested interests. So farm, farmers find this complex, uh, not necessarily having the right skill sets. They know about farming. They don't necessarily know about forestry. Um, you know, forest, foresters and farmers have different goals, objectives, interests. They use different metrics for measurement. Um, uh, land tenure is a, is a, is a potential issue. You know, trees are a long, long-term project. Uh, they don't necessarily have the skills and knowledge, or, or knowledge of those sort of longer-term markets. So it's it's bridging those gaps between forestry and farming it is going to be increasingly important in terms of a multi-functional land use. In terms of policy, uh, twenty years ago, um, if you planted more than 50 trees per hectare on a parcel of land, it ceased to be eligible for agricultural support systems throughout the EU. We managed to get that changed in 2011. In 2020, the uh, English government um, revised the um, basic payment scheme to permit 
uh, agroforestry to be used on agricultural land whilst retaining the basic payment scheme. Um, and, and there is support under the Ingham, EWCO, Ingham Woodland Creation Offer, offer in some elements to provide uh, agroforestry support. Um, but I think what's coming over the hill uh, quite quickly uh, as the ELMS uh, programme gets implemented uh, under new domestic agricultural policy from 2024 next year, we should have a an agroforestry um, measure under the Sustainable Farming Incentive, which will provide funding for uh, establishing and ongoing management of agroforestry. Uh, that's been um, referred to a co-design process as part of a testing trial program between 2019-2023, engaging uh, farmers, foresters, land managers, NGOs, etc., various stakeholders, uh, and, and focusing around sort of six different agroforestry systems and a range of mo sort of monitor farmers, which we've been working with over the last last few years. How that's going to look uh, will, like all the other SFI schemes, will be around a sort of introductory, immediate, intermediate, and advanced level. Um, for both silver halt, silver pasture, and silver arable systems, um, there'll be likely to be longer agreements, recognising that the trees are a longer-term element than a three-year cycle, uh, with transferable agreements between land occupiers. It's likely to have a, um, a requirement for a management plan, although that won't be scored, uh, and, a, and a pest risk management plan. And, and also a um, uh, some funding for training and learning, um, and payments really to provide capital establishment payments and also revenue payments, sort of ongoing maintenance payments, which will also be available for those farmers that have already got agroforestry in place. So those are those are the sort of uh, uh, in draft proposals which are likely to come, although the payment rates obviously not just not uh, agreed yet. So to give you a, a, a quick run through of what we've done on our own farm, we're over in the eastern counties, just on the edge of Peterborough. We're a mixed, um, uh, sort of mixed land use between here, here and also in Rutland. Uh, we've been farming organically since 2005, a uh, mixture of owned and tenanted uh, property. We're actually on a Cambridge County Council uh, holding, which we, we started the tenancy in 2007. Um, on a 15 year farm business tenancy, and, and that's where the agroforestry is. And our drivers really were that the, the farm was pretty tired when we took it on. It had grown wheat, obviously, grape, sugar beet, potatoes for probably 30 plus years. Soils were pretty tired. Um, and we wanted to move it to a sort of more multifunctional land use, uh, have more diversity within our cropping and enterprises, improve the, the sort of soil protection. And, and increase sort of biodiversity and habitat and market opportunities. As you can see from the picture, uh, not long after we moved in, there were some fairly um, memorable um, uh, pen blows um, where soil is just sort of stripped off the land. And as a, someone that trained as a soil scientist, I, I couldn't really accept that. I wanted to do something about uh, addressing those kind of challenges. And after thinking about lots of different options, agroforestry seem to be the logical way forward for us. We have two main soil types here, here at the farm at Whitehall. Uh, we have a sort of peaty loam and then we have brick clay, but not far from the, the brick factory. And the, the, the peaty loams are subject to quite a lot of wind blow and the brick clays are what I would call miniature soils. They, in one minute they can go from porridge to concrete and, uh, and we needed to find a way of actually improving those as well in, in the same light. So our challenges were, obviously, we're tenants. We're on a 15-year farm business tenancy. We needed to retain eligibility for the common agricultural policy at the time. Limited capital, cap, capital. the system had to be profitable. In fact, our tenancy says no livestock. So we needed to develop a system that was, that was largely a cropping-based system. And we, we wanted to improve our sort of soil, uh, soil protection, soil conservation. So balancing some long-term and short-term the goals. Uh, we design, I designed the system um, and um, we put in 125 acres or 52 hectares of agroforestry in 2009. Um, 
uh, and that was based on 85 trees per hectare. Um, if you take just the strips where the trees are, um, that occupies four hectares on 52, yeah. so it's about 8% of the land area. 92% um, is doing exactly what it was doing before. So it's a relatively small area of the farm, um, but providing a greater benefit than putting perhaps four and a half thousand trees or four hectares worth of trees just in one field by spreading over a larger area it brings a lot of co-benefits. So the system's designed around uh, tree size, uh, matching it with machinery and matching it with sort of field size, where we're 85 versus, you know, sort of commercial orchard would be 850 trees per hectare, with three meters between each tree in the row, with 27 meters between each row of trees, uh, giving us a 24 meter working width between the rows and a three meter sort of pollen and nectar strip underneath underneath the trees. Um, because we're subject to internal drainage board regulations, uh, we left a sort of 24 meter turning uh, uh, headland at the end of each end to sort of turn machinery and allow the sort of uh, ditches to be cleaned out on a, on a regular basis. The kids involved in 2009 to do some measurement uh, so it's part of the curriculum um, and then we had the sort of all this winter in 30 years in in, in 2008-9 um, uh, so they got a baptism of fire so you can see how big the trees were when they went in they were basically sticks sticks supported by a a, a, a machine post and a, and a wire guard um, system was designed always to be allow the use of commercial machinery so field, field scale machinery uh, which we continue to do um, all the way through the sort of cropping system as the as the crops have grown. Um, the pollen nectar species was planted under all the trees to provide a, a habitat um, and allow sort of stacking of enterprises with a bee enterprise as well. Um, and, and those trees have continued to grow and allow us to do sort of mechanical operations. Um, what it has allowed us to do is, is actually develop a controlled traffic farming system. All our cereals are are mechanically weeded with a Garford Robo crop computer guided system um, where uh, the Robo crop actually allows us to have a, um, a controlled traffic farming system. We run a fairly lean set of equipment across the farm, uh, sort of treading lightly, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, but we've developed a sort of controlled traffic farming system. So all our machinery now is six meters. And that integrates well across that sort of 24 meter working alley. And that's then allowed us to companion plant. So we've not only got trees and then a cereal, but we've got an understory of clover growing at the same time. So the solar panels are very much turned on always to, to harvest that, um, that, that major input of being sunlight. So this is sort of more what it looks like now as, as the system's got bigger, more mature. Uh, you have alleys of crops with the trees running in a north-south direction, which then minimizes the shade. Um, it, 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 it does mean the landscape looks a little different, but I think it brings a, it brings a good element to, uh, to what we're doing. Um, we have, uh, as I said, we have a bee enterprise on the farm as well. They obviously help with the fruit, but so we, we have quite a lot of areas just for, just for insects. Um, crop production continues as per normal. I just need to make sure I drive the combine straight because a, a fruit tree doesn't tend to go through a combine particularly well. Um, that's sort of what it looks like from above. Um, I'm the one that does the planting. I'm the one that does the combining. So we have to make sure we get it right. Uh, and um, and then we go back, we'll harvest the cereals and then go back and do a second harvest and harvest the fruit um, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a secondary crop of 13 different varieties, um, which... Uh, initially, we sold into the wholesale market. Now we're doing sort of more direct marketing. Um, this is sort of last year's productivity. What you can see is we, we've got a mixture of sort of oat and wheat and, um, and fruit here on, on a budget. Um, and it gives us a fairly healthy um, uh, gross margin on, on the various crops. And, and especially on the fruit, we can actually add value to that fruit by uh, processing and retailing. Uh, which was the sort of next thing we went into. Uh, in terms of resilience, to give you an example, in 2019, there were some pretty meaty storms in the middle of August uh, in this part of the world, in East Anglia, 
um, and we had three days of about 60 mile an hour winds when the crops were ripe and ready for harvest. And it resulted in about 20% of the grain being dropped out of the, the grain ear uh, and deposited on the floor, as you can see on the right, which is a complete loss. Um, however, in the agroforestry, whilst we lost a bit of fruit, it reduced the, the loss from about 20% to about 10% of grain loss because we were reducing uh, wind speed at ground level. So that, that means very much that um, uh, it's building resilience into the system for us. And the other thing that we've seen as well is that typically I was expecting that, that we would see gr greater grain production in the middle of the alleys and, and probably less nearer the trees uh, at the edges. But in fact, now the trees are mature, we're seeing the reverse. We're seeing bigger crops for uh, four to six metres out from the edge of the tree strips. Um, and that's what we believe is from great improved drainage in the winter um, and improve moisture retention in the summer. Uh, some of the work we've been doing with, um, well, we've got four PhD students studying stuff at the moment from the farm, a couple of MSCs, and we're certainly seeing higher levels of mycorrhizal activity in the soil uh, and more adjacent to the tree. And that's obviously bringing, um, bringing some benefit to the productivity. So you, you can very clearly see that um, if you use the combine as a sort of data, so much so that I have to sort of tilt the header on the combine. And it's not just us, this is a friend of mine that farms down in, in Western France. And uh, uh, this picture here of his very mature walnut wheat system, you can see the same phenomena happening on, nearer the edge of, of, of the strip there compared to uh, in the center. So what have we learned? Well, that agroforestry is doable on a large scale, that it's, it's, it's sort of managed complexity, it's more management intense. Um, uh, but it's giving us resilience, it's giving us profitability equal to or better than the monocultural system. Um, there's been some policy challenges. Uh, we certainly know that people want to see agroforestry in the flesh. Um, and, and we don't have all the answers, but we're working with researchers to try and get some of those answers. Um, we, we've keyed into specialty markets, so we grow a lot of oats uh, as one of the few farms in the country that certified organic also as a gluten-free producer um, and then we harvest the fruit uh, which uh, we can sell fresh uh, through our retail business or we can actually put into juice uh, and, and sell you know it, it's notable to recognize that if you look at uh, the last 30 years in terms of where the where the where the, um, the value in the food chain is the farming is the light blue bit at the bottom so we're only capturing as farmers somewhere between seven and nine percent, seven and ten percent of the of the food chain value. Most of the food chain value is is in the um, manufacturing, wholesaling, retailing, or catering. Uh, so important to try and capture some of that. So we took our decision sort of four and a half years ago to to build a, a farm shop and and and, and retail centre. Uh, so we opened up a farm shop just before. Um, uh, the pandemic, which was an interesting bumpy ride, uh, but that does mean that we can retail uh, our apple juice directly and capture that value as part of uh, as part of the business model. Um, so, I guess to summarise, agroforestry, in my mind, is ecological intensification. It's taking those those e ecology principles uh, of, of mimicking natural systems, um, improving resource and capture and use on farm of those valuable sunlight inputs, we're certainly seeing profitability equal to or greater than a monoculture system. It's delivering on soil and biodiversity um, uh, aspirations. Um, densities are between sort of 80, 100 trees per hectare seem to work quite well. Um, the alley croppings maintaining our annual income on that to 92%, and the trees are providing us a, a long term income. Um, and uh, and the policy is now starting to develop and, and catch up with some of these uh, these elements. So uh, certainly, as humans, we move from single-story dwellings to multi-story dwellings to high-rise. Um, uh, agroforestry, I believe, is a is a sort of climate smart approach to land management, um, mimicking nature and, and 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 stacking those enterprises together to give us resilience and and also productivity at the same time. Farmers could easily 
and top 20% of the land and their agroforestry, they don't need to do the whole lot. And some of the, the calculations we've done with the Woodland Trust would suggest that 5.8% of the land under agroforestry could largely meet our, or agricultural land could largely meet our net zero emissions target under the Paris Accord. And, and we're running at 8% here, so we're well above that 5% target, 5.8% target. And agroforestry is one of those few options with the potential to help reduce CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, um, help protect natural resources, and and continue to produce more food and biomass, not necessarily requiring more inputs to achieve that. And innovation and adaptation will be will be key, uh, and, uh, and and as farmers, we're pretty good at trying to achieve that. So. I've run slightly over on time, but um, uh, apologies for that. But uh, hopefully that gives you a flavour of what we've been doing. That's great. Thanks very much, Stephen. And I can see we've got some questions um, uh, coming through on the chat. You, you don't have to worry about tracking those. We'll um, we'll we'll um, we'll draw them out and give them to you. But um, if I, I'll I'll just kick off with a, an introductory one that just struck me while you were talking. I was looking at the climate change committee's report earlier on today from a few years ago and they were talking about um and this was the first sort of major report on the the net zero 2050 target and and, and what it meant for land use uh, they were talking about the area of cropland and grassland needed to be planted with trees increasing to 10 percent by 2050 i think that was not a forestation but sort of farmland trees um, um and, and you, you said you've got eight percent of 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 your land um, covered with trees. I mean that that still looks like the expectation nationally or the hope nationally might might need to be that everybody's doing at least what you're doing, which is a profound sort of re revolution. Um, what how do you see the prospects? Because there's not much of it about just yet, but um, how do you see things unfolding? So, you know, climate, the Climate Change Committee have said we want to move from 13 to 70 percent tree cover. So if we want tree cover on an island, which 75 percent of which is agricultural, then there has to be some trees planted on, on, on farmland. And if that's the case, we need to also maintain productivity of, you know, fruit, nut, timber, biomass, etc. So having an integrated system uh, seems a logical way. Um, uh, and and that's what we've tried to do here, but in a you know in a commercially in a, in a commercially viable way. So so there's certainly there's certainly potential. As I said earlier, though, the challenge is that most farmers now to grow crops or are animals, they don't necessarily know so much about trees. So so we've got to we've got to blend those skills together a bit. And uh, land tenure is a big issue. You know, thirty percent of our land base is tenanted. Um, uh, and uh, it requires the ability to to plant trees on tenanted land. Um, we're tenants, and we found a way to do it, but it's it's challenging. Uh, maybe we need multi. If we want multifunctional land use, we need multi-occupier land use to make sure that we can access people with a you know a multitude of skills and capital, etc. I've got a couple of other little ones which I think I'll I'll squeeze in now. Just um. Uh, abusing my position really but when you talked about um 140 percent uh use a 40 percent bounce uh, and then some other studies had got to at least 20 or 30 percent the sort yeah. of uplift on um the productivity uh i wasn't clear is is that just the crops on the ground or are you adding in the you no, adding in the crops from the trees it, it, as well it's, it's the, everything so it's total yeah. biomass production yeah so, right. so it's it's both elements it's all elements yeah okay great and um the, the this final one from me um you, you said that you, your tenancy said you couldn't have livestock um if you didn't have that constraint would you want to incorporate some livestock in your system would that would that would that be beneficial for you i think it would yeah i mean we do have livestock we have earthworms <laughs> lots of them but but uh, um and bees uh, as long as i don't have to ear tag them um uh i think i think there would be opportunities to do that i would probably opt to try and have a sort of joint venture approach whereby somebody else had a sheep flock or a cattle herd and, and we integrated our, our management together. And, and I, I think that gives the sort of best opportunities, but, you know, we're not in that position. 
Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Um, so let's have a look at what we've got. We've got lots of, uh, so there's one from um, Sabina. Do you get your organic gluten-free oats processed or do you yeah. sell them pre-processed? So we have a really nice, uh, <clears throat> depends how much you want to buy. <laughs> Commercial answer. Um, uh, our oats go to Glee Farm Foods, uh, Huntingdon. That's only sort of 20 miles away from us. Uh, we 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 were part of a grower group which I helped put together with them to supply gluten free certified oats to a gluten free mill, and then actually there's a nice virtuous circle in that we sell some of that product in our farm shop as well. So um, yeah, they are processed and they they find their way into a quite a lot of market products, but um, that that gives us an organic uh, and also a gluten free certification, which gives us uh, the ability to capture some value. I can see one from Jez and one from India that sort of overlaps a bit with what I asked. I'll come back to that at the end if we've got if we if we've got time. But um, uh, another a different Neil, not me. Have you been able to record how much leaf fall from lines of trees add to the soil organic matter and nutrients in the adjacent arable script strips, leading to perhaps re reduced fertilizer use? Uh, um, in, in our, in the answer to that is no. <laughs> it's it's on a very big long list of uh, questions I have. Um, we do know we're sequestering around four and a half tons per hectare of carbon just from the tree growth per hectare, uh, but I haven't I haven't captured the leaf litter. Um, so if you know any budding PhD or MSc students who would like another project, bring them on. I was going to say that actually, you, uh, it's not only that you're being very productive from an agricultural point of view, but also from a from there's a scientific um, intensity to, to what you're doing as well with all your PhD students and master students working. You're, you're in the market for more research being done on your farm. I've got, you? I've got an inquisitive mind and not enough time to answer the questions. So, um, and you know, we only, we only get to do these, you know, these experiments once a year uh, uh, in the cycle of production. So the more, the more questions we can answer by stacking some of those research um, activities, the better. OK, well, we've had over 90 participants and quite a chunk of them will be academic researchers, I'm sure. So um, so that, that's a that's a good opportunity there for people if they want to pick that up and pursue it. Um, so another question, um, do you use any carbon footprint? How does it how does it account for agroforestry? How well do you think it applies? I think that so, mean, might mean ca carbon footprint calculators. I'm not sure. Yeah. So we've looked at quite a number of the, uh, the, the calculators. Um, uh, quite a number of them don't account for agroforestry. Um, and the biggest challenge for us is, is a you know it's a, it's a fairly it's a unique system, but it's a it's an emerging system, so it doesn't tend to fall into some of these carbon calculators easily. Um, we've had to do some of the measurement by you know literally pulling a tree out of the ground and measuring it and weighing it and see how uh, how big it's got. Um, um, the uh, the, the big one of the challenges for us is actually because some of the soils are peat based um it is actually the best thing we could do if we wanted to have it you know a, 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 a negative um emissions profile would, would actually be just to stop farming it at all because any kind of disturbance is on, on peat soils is a, is a um uh, has a, a, a co2 impact but by reducing evapotranspiration and water loss by slowing down wind at ground level, we believe we're having a pretty, pretty positive impact on on reducing that drying of peat and reducing uh, CO two loss. Right, I can see a helpful comment from Scott at Defra on the ten percent issue. The UK government goal is to get ten percent of UK farmland under agroforestry management, but it doesn't state the density or nature of agroforestry. So, it, so it's not just measuring the strips which the trees are on, but the whole. The whole of the system, and so so it would be all, all, it would include all the cereal land in between, presumably. Yeah, that's right. So, so it's, it's it's gross area as yeah, opposed to right. net area. I mean, okay. we, we could have, frankly, we could have put all the four and a half thousand fruit trees of thirteen varieties in one field, but then we would have just had another monoculture with all the associated issues that go with that. Uh, and by spreading them over fifty-two hectares, not only do we get nearly no pest and disease problems in the fruit crops. Um, it actually provides a lot of benefit in terms of wind reduction, uh, edge, uh, edge habitat, uh, and biodiversity right across the landscape, which is what we were trying to trying to achieve. Yeah. 
Okay, a question from Connor. Crudely, our agroforestry is similar to having many smaller fields with hedgerows. Has anyone looked at the effects of hedge loss in the UK during the 20th century and applied this to an agroforestry context? Um, how do you envisage your forestry strips looking in 50 years time? Will you enable them to become a little bit more like ancient hedgerow, thereby further enhancing biodiversity and trapping more carbon? It, you could argue that we're, we, in the UK, we're an agroforestry landscape because we have hedges. The challenge is that hedges, other than providing a biodiversity benefit to a farm, don't appear generally in terms of the um, uh, the bottom line on most um, profit and loss accounts. So they don't contribute uh, economically to the farm in a significant way. So what we've done is, you know, that this, you could say these are hedges, they're tree hedges, but not only do they contribute in a landscape and biodiversity context, they also contribute uh, economically to the farm as well. So that's a different conversation when they start to have an economic value. So, so yes, you could you could describe these as a hedges, and hedges are part of agroforestry, um, especially if they if they're managed or implemented in a way that can contribute um, economically to the business. Yeah. Uh, one from James at the Anderson Centre. We've seen significant challenges for commercial orchard businesses in the last 12, 18 months. Are there significant market opportunities available to support wider scale adoption of agroforestry? So, um, you know, the beauty for us is that, as I said, this isn't a, uh, because it's a polyculture, uh, we've got 8% in trees and 92% in crops, we're, we're spreading risk. Uh, in terms of our production and our market market uh, access, market opportunities, um, and you know that, there are some real issues around uh, you know the, the productive potential and also the economic viability of of orchard systems. Um, what we've chosen to do is, is is have quite a low input based system, whereas orchards tend to be quite intensive. Uh, and therefore, the economics surrounding that intensive production are, you know, are, are pretty pretty tight. But we can we can afford to have a low impact, low intensity system, and capture some of the value, in our case, by by retailing. Um, but you know, we could sell wholesale. Um, but it, it gives us that uh, that landscape and environmental benefit, which is what we're we're seeking, whilst still having a, you know, a, a sensible economic performance. So it's about risk management. No, this is providing, taking a lot of risk out of what we do. Um, ben says, while it isn't strictly agri-environment, could the uptake of agroforestry be encouraged through the existing farmer cluster system? Yes. <laughs> so there's, there's, there would be great opportunity, Ben, to uh, to have a sort of, you know, level of connectivity. So you've got more than one farm doing it. And uh, uh, you've got those sort of... Um, uh, Connections, landscape scale, scale connections. I think um, neighbor, neighbor, a few neighbours are starting to look at what we're doing now and think about doing doing something. Um, although it's you know it, it's challenging. <laughs> uh, Diana has a question along those lines. Um, have you managed to convince any conventional farmers to adopt agroforestry? I, I don't know whether your neighbours are conventional or unconventional, but um, uh, let's, all, let's not worry about that. There um, are way, how, way, so how did you do it? There are way more people doing agroforestry throughout Europe uh, who are you know, using fertilizers and chemicals, etc., than there are organic farmers. That's for sure. I mean, there are a number of farmers in the UK doing agroforestry conventionally very successfully. Uh, as I say, it's more management complex. You have to think about some of the choices you're doing um, and you know, sprays you're putting on. But one of the curious things is that people always worry about spray drift and aren't they going to damage the trees? But because you've cut wind speed down at ground level, you get more spray days and lower wind velocities in the agroforestry than you do in open fields. So it's less of an issue than you think. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, rabbits and deer. Uh, so to what extent do you, do you suffer any losses from grazers like that? And um, which tree guards are best? Uh, um, so... Rabbits, not so much a problem for us. Hares were a big problem. Uh, we put a um, wire mesh guard around all the trees. Um, and, you know, depending on the trees, types and species, 
we use wire mesh because fruit trees can get canker. If you're growing a timber tree or a different kind of tree, you could maybe use a tubex type guard or a, or a wire mesh type guard. Um, deer, there are deer here. We we have regularly 20 or 30 deer around. They only really bother the trees when a tree's fallen over. Um, actually, our biggest problem was an establishment was birds. Um, I hadn't realized we were establishing four and a half thousand roosting posts for pigeons. And uh, when those trees were very small, two pigeons lay, landing on a tree would break the top out of a, tree, a very young tree. So we had to go back in and put four and a half thousand bamboo canes, tall bamboo canes on every tree for somewhere for the pigeons to land. Now the trees have got bigger, not a problem. Okay, I'm rattling through these to try and get as many done um, before we finish. But um, one of I'll just group some of these up. Uh, apart from apple trees, what tree crops do you what tree crops do you think are suitable? And uh, and could you say a bit more about upland systems? A cu couple there. About what tree systems? Up upland systems. Okay. Um, so well, basically there there are not many trees that you couldn't put into this type of system, but it's about right tree in the right place, right tree for the right agroclimatic location and importantly what's your market you know are you prepared to wait 150 years for an oak tree income or do you need something sooner one of my our choices as tenants was we needed an economic return within the 15 years of our life tenancy which is um which meant that that was one of the reasons for picking fruit not poplars or oak um in terms of upland systems some really good examples up in up in both in Wales and in Scotland of agroforestry, especially the provision of shelter and shade for uh, ruminants um, and the ability for them to to use the trees not only for shade shade and shelter but also as a browsing element and increasing you know body temperature, which means they put more energy into to growing rather than just keeping warm. So there's some there's some good examples uh, in upland systems, but it, again, it's about the right. The right context and the right trees in the right place. Uh, and a question on the crops between the trees. Um, so, does it make much difference what sort of crop that is? Or does it suit some crops more than others? Um, uh, it, it depends on the tree. I mean, if you our trees are relatively small because we want to pick them. Um, uh, if you had a very very big tree um, that was thirty or forty feet tall and there was slightly more shade, there are some crops that are you know, very light hungry, like maize as an example, uh, and some of the brassica crops, um, the, the crops, there wouldn't be good combinations. But generally speaking, most cereals, pulses, and quite a lot of vegetable crops will thrive quite happily uh, and underneath uh, or, or alongside the trees. If you consider that a wheat crop only uses between 60 and 70% of the solar radiation, 30% of the solar radiation grows weeds which is why you have to then go and deal with them in some form. If it used 100% of the solar radiation, there wouldn't be any weeds. There wouldn't be any space for weeds. So it's about managing that light and that photosynthetic activity. So most combinations can be, there's some tweaks, but there are many combinations that can work together. Okay, great. Um, so there's some more good, we're not gonna get through them all. I'm gonna squeeze this last one in. Um, any potential for a third layer between the, um, between the crop in the in the middle and the trees, so sort of fruiting shrubs or something like that. Well, effe we're, effectively, we're doing that. So, as you can see from the picture behind me on the screen, we've got the trees, and then we've got a pollen nectar strip underneath, which is providing pollination services as part of the bee enterprise. And then we've got the cereals, and then they're under same with clovers. So we're stacking we're stacking all those different elements together. But you know, potentially. Uh, if I had more than seven days in a week, um, I could put maybe soft fruit or, or vegetables underneath the trees and have a third element as well. But it's it's about how much time there is in a day and a week <laughs> to be able to do that. But yeah. very, very, very much has potential. I don't think we're going to get through um, any more because I'm going to have to wind up to finish by four. But thanks very much, Stephen. And you got we got a lot of questions covered there. You're very succinct in your addressing the questions. Um, so thanks very much. I, I I just wanted to well, uh, someone in the Q and A space has uh, called a top anonymous attendee. I said brilliant presentation, so informative. Thank you for the amazing work you're doing on your farm. Um, 
and there's a question there that we haven't got time to cover but uh just to say um our next webinar is likely to be on the 7th of july um, before we have a little break for summer we're hoping to do something possibly on carbon markets and finance for that one but watch this space um, also look out for our podcasts the first one which reflects on some of the issues raised by henry dimbleby's webinar and the second one uh, was based on our big tent event that we held in Leeds towards the end of April. Um, so um, Jez might be able to put a link in the chat to our um, podcasts, or if not, you can get them through the, the network website. And um, finally, we welcome any comments and suggestions for speakers or podcast interviewees if you that you'd like to hear in the, in the series. So um, you can either email me at neil.ward at uea.ac.uk or Jez, who's j.fridaberg at uea.ac.uk. So thanks very much. Um, thanks again, Stephen. That was great to um, get through so much material there. Really, really interesting. And um, we'll put it up on the on the YouTube before too long. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Neil and, and Jez. Um, just, just to finish off and say it's Open Farm Sunday this weekend, the 11th. So uh, get yourselves out on farms. Uh, we've got a big Open Farm Sunday event happening here at the farm. So if anybody's bored, you're more than welcome to visit. That'd be a good day out. Anyone who can get to near Peterborough. <laughs> there we go. Thanks very much. Thanks. And have, have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks.